The final lecture, Phenomenology, a philosophy of being in the world with relevance for design. You may have wondered what this art piece is about. Um, so this is a work by Marcel Duchamp, which uh, sits in the MoMA in New York. And what I really like about it is that um, there's two ways to look at this art piece. One, one is to look at it from this side, which is sort of the, in a way you could say the, the objective side or the, the side that, you, that makes you take a distance from the art piece and look at the object as a thing. And then you can read, for example, the instructions that are on it, because it says on the instructions, this piece is, it says in French, to be looked at from the other side with one eye from up close for at least one hour. Let's suppose that the, the woman that we see on the other side is actually doing this and she's looking through that hole in according to the instructions for at least one hour. Then she would actually appreciate the, the meaning and she would experience the value of this art by following the instructions, by interacting with the art piece in a certain way. And in a way she's not, not even looking at the art object so much she's using the art object as a tool if you wish to look through it to the world and seeing the world in a new light over time if you wait long enough apparently you will feel or see something we don't know exactly what this is but this is what Duchamp is sort of challenging us to to experience right whereas from this side the so-called sort of the de detached or distant side we are looking at the art piece more as, a, as an object and we are more uh, thinking about it and talking about it and contemplating it, right? We are the art critics on this side and looking, oh yeah, this is an interesting piece by Marcel Duchamp. He's a famous artist and oh, look how he's making, sort of uh, challenging us here and so on, right? So I think that this is a nice, metaphor or image that we can use for talking about phenomenology because phenomenology tries to get at the world from the perspective of the woman we see here it tries to say okay how can we experience get back to the, the raw experience of how you experience the world before we even start to think about it and this other side that we are now in because we're looking at this art piece from the other side, from the wrong side, so to speak, is, according to phenomenology, also the wrong side to look at things. And ironically enough, this is the side that science is often on. Science tries to explain and model and theorize the world from a distance, right? not being involved in it, but stepping aside from it, because science wants to be objective. But what phenomenology says is that if, if you want to be objective, you sort of you miss out certain qualities of the world as it is precisely because you move yourself away from the world now i often use this example of sailing but um, because now it's such strange corona times i also um, went out into a little park and uh, did some filmings just of the world outside just because I could and because I'm now recording this. So this lecture I will try to put in a little bit of that here and there in the edit uh, where I think it may help. So this will be the final day uh, sort of historical record of this hair because actually I have an appointment with the hairdresser. The reason I'm out here in the field so to speak is that I thought that a change of scenery could uh, could help a little bit to get some flavor of what this phenomenology is all about. Uh, but in order to do that, I actually have to switch the camera from pointing at me to pointing at the world. So we are walking here in a little park. There's 
some people, there's birds, all kinds of things. Maybe you don't hear the surrounding sound so much uh, because I'm using uh, the camera, uh, the microphone. So what's this phenomenology all about? But I will also explain the example of sailing as I normally do in the lecture. If you look at, if you are a beginning sailor, um, you will uh, see the lake a little bit like this. You see all kinds of boats and you are yourself also in a boat. And what happens is that at some point, one of these boats can come up very close, almost hitting you. And if you are a beginning sailor, you didn't see it coming. Right? You had no idea that the boat was, that you were actually dangerously moving uh, on a sort of course, uh, crashing into the other. So this you have to learn. Right? Now, what you learn is to look at these boats and see how they move relative to the background and relative to you. So the teacher will tell you that um, uh, the, the theory of it, and, and, but the theory is of course not the same as you experience it in, in practice. So, um, so here you see two, two boats closing very uh, closely by each other. Um, and the theory that you learn is this theory. So there's all kinds of rules, like who, ha who has to give way to the other boat and how you have to turn. And what you learn, um, uh, so what you learn in theory is to look at the boats from, from the top, so to speak, as if you were in a helicopter and you try to reason about how these boats have to move relative to one another, which is sort of this perspective. But of course, that's not how you really experience sailing if you're in the boat. If you're in the boat, it looks much more like this. And you have to look at the little boats as they come and, and, and make a judgment about what they will do and what you have to do. Now, what they teach you is that if, if boats come up at you in this way, as you see now, then at this moment, with a static picture, there's no way in which you can make out whether you will crash into one of these boats or not. But if the boats are moving and you are moving, what you will see is that the background, so let's say um, these things here and the horizon, if you look at it relative to this boat, either the boat is sort of going to the left relative to the background, which in, in at least in Dutch sail schools, they call it, it's eating land, or this boat is sort of, is sort of falling away to the right and sort of spitting out land on this side. Now, if it's spitting out of land, the boat will pass you on the right side. So this is the starboard side. If it's um, eating land, it will pass you on the other side, on this side, the left side. But if the boat stays exactly put relative to a dot on the horizon behind it, so it doesn't eat and it doesn't spit, then you're in danger because that means the boat is coming right at you and it will crash into you unless one of you will change its course. Now first you learn this in theory, which is sort of the objective distant way of looking at it. But at some point it just becomes automatic for you. And at that moment, suddenly you see this entire lake with boats with new eyes. The whole world, if you would say it, would, would sort of have would would be would change the whole world would now suddenly look different to you. It will be a different world because suddenly all these boats here are constantly in the position of being either coming right at you or passing you in theory on the left side or passing you in theory on the right side. So this means that having learned this skill of looking at boats in a certain way, in the beginning, it's theory, you have to think about it and reason about it, and you want to apply it to the stuff you see, but at some point it becomes integrated in how the world appears to you in the first instance. So the world just is, at that moment, a world of boats that crash into you, go left or go right. That's just the way the boats look to you. That's, in Gibson's terms, you would say, that's what the affordance is that they have at that moment for you. Whereas if you were a novice, there's no such affordance. These boats are just <clears throat> meaningless objects to you and suddenly they start to crash into you when it's too late to uh, act, respond to it anymore. 
Now, phenomenology tries to get at this experience of how the world looks at you, how the world appears to you as already in some sense meaningful. So in this case, for a skilled sailor, the boats already immediately are dangerous, safe, safe on the left, safe on the right side, and so on. That's what they look to the sailor if the sailor is looking out onto those boats. And this is directly coupled also to what the sailor is doing. So in some sense, I've done some sailing. If I look at these boats, I sort of already feel my shoulder and I feel my hand holding the rod behind me. And if I look at this, I already, I sort of feel how I would move my boat immediately in response to what I see. And the movement, so already making a move relative to a boat that is coming, is on crash course to you, and you already immediately feel yourself, so to speak, move the boat the, min the moment you see that boat, right? You immediately respond to it, or you, or you are poised to respond. You, you, you feel a certain tension in your arm saying, okay, so that boat is on crash course, so I'm gonna keep an eye on that boat. And I'm gonna, I, I feel it constantly before I make my move and make sure that I'm out of the way. Yeah. So well, you can learn all the theory you want, but there are certain things you just have to experience by practice. For example, being on a lake with this kind of uh, sky, if you're an experienced sailor, you would already have quickly been off the water a long time before this happened, right? So you immediately see meaning and you see how serious the situation, you, you see the change in the water, the wind, and at some point you start to feel, oh, wait a minute, maybe we should be heading back to the harbor just about now, right? So that kind of feeling of what the, what the, lake, what the lake tells you is something that you feel in your body and it, it's before you start to apply all kinds of theories and so on. The same is that if you go out of the harbor, you immediately see already, oh, that would be a spot where I'm gonna put my boat to raise the sails, or this is how I'm gonna approach the harbor in coming back, right? It's never completely easy, but the more experience you have, the more in advance you already see all the kinds of things that should be happening. You don't have to think about it. Now, why study phenomenology? Well, the point is that many of the technologies that we have today still sort of in a way uh, do not acknowledge this embodied meaning making that we do, eh? that we, the, 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 the way a sailor automatically feels the lake, the boat, and, and uh, sees the other boats. Um, as, as meaningful objects. That, that's not often how we, how we look at it. Very often interactive technology is made as if we are distant from it, as if we are looking at it not, as Marcel Duchamp would say, look from up close for an hour, look through it. No, we look at it from the other side, from the wrong side. We look at technology as a kind of a screen with information on it that we look at and think about, right? So, so for example, Paul Doris, says that even in virtual reality, and I'm quoting him here, users are disconnected observers of a world that they do not inhabit directly. They peer out at it, they try to figure out what's going on, they decide on a course of action, and they use the narrow interface of keyboard or data glove to try and get something done, right? But our experience in the everyday world is not of that sort. We inhabit our bodies, and the, our bodies inhabit the world, and we have seamless connections with the world, back and forth. Yeah. So phenomenology is about that. Phenomenology is about how our bodies inhabit the world. Yeah. And that's a different vocabulary, different words, different metaphors, different ways of thinking about it than traditional cognitive science does, and then traditional psychology and sociology does. And therefore, I think phenomenology is a very interesting uh, philosophy because it allows us to think more about how we can could create these seamless connections between ourselves, the technology, and the world around us.
Now there's <clears throat> a number of important phenomenologists and in this lecture I would just try to do a little bit of background so that you have enough of idea of it that if you want to study more of it you can dive into it. Um, also um, the movie that we're seeing, the movie is called Being in the World uh, and it's a movie about Hubert Dreyfus. And Hubert Dreyfus was an American um, philosopher who was strongly interested in artificial intelligence on the one hand and on the other hand he was very interested in Martin Heidegger who was one of the big phenomenologists and he sort of proved through Heidegger that artificial intelligence was on the wrong track at least that was his his claim and this movie that we're seeing uh, explains that explains that very well so i it, it wouldn't make much sense to try and sort of repeat the whole story that is told there. So I will keep it brief, try to keep it brief in this lecture. And I really encourage you uh, to see the movie. It's a, it's a good movie. So we're going to talk a little bit about Edmund Husserl. We're going to talk a little bit about Martin Heidegger. We're going to talk a little bit about Maurice Merleau-Ponty, a French um, philosopher. Um, and a little bit about Hubert Dreyfus, perhaps. Then I'm just going to drop some names here if you want to read more. Um, there are several people that have written about phenomenology and technology. Uh, for example, Paul Dorish has a great book. Really encourage you to read that. Lucy Suchman we already talked about, who had Hubert Dreyfus as PhD supervisor. So there's some phenomenology definitely also in her work, uh, although she is also very strongly committed to a more uh, sociological framework, which is called ethno-methodology, which is more about uh, analyzing, for example, through conversation analysis, how people interact with each other and communicate. Um, Tony Robertson, Australian uh, human-computer interaction researcher, um, wrote uh, several good papers on Merleau-Ponty and the relation of that to interaction design. Uh, Philip Agra is very interesting. A uh, person who uh, wrote uh, a very nice paper on the idea of the life world, and the life world is is sort of this. If you would say for a sailor, the lake and the boats on it are a life world, and they have all kinds of meaning, but only for a sailor. So if you're part of the community of practice of something, you live in a certain world, and certain things have certain meaning for you. Whereas if you come into that same space as a novice or somebody who doesn't know anything about what's going on there you see you don't see the you don't see what's going on right so you don't understand it and you have to learn it well what this world is like that you know once you are skilled in dealing with it that's called the life world and philip agra wrote about it uh, in relation to technology and and products and he was inspired by alfred schutz who is here a little bit behind me um, who was the first phenomenologist who wrote about the life world. Um, Weinograd and Flores are two people who wrote uh, a book critiquing traditional user interface design using Heidegger as an inspiration. Of course, we have Peter Paul Verbeek, our own philosopher at the UT Twente. He is a Heidegger scholar, um, but he also is critiquing Heidegger because he thinks that Heidegger was much too negative about technology. Um, and he sort of wants to go beyond it and, and say, okay, what can we still do with technology knowing, being more critical about it and thinking about it a little bit more deeply than is normally done. Uh, interesting person also is Charles Lenay, who worked together with Pierre Lévy, and Pierre Lévy is a researcher in Eindhoven at the Industrial Design Department. Uh, they've also done a lot on phenomenology and especially the idea of Mer uh, Merleau-Ponty. So this is the sort of the French connection here. Uh, Merleau-Ponty talked about how two people see each other. So you, uh, if we talk with one another live, uh, you will see in my expression, you will see that I also see you. And, and I see that you see me. So think about what, what I just said. Um, and so this goes both ways and you, you get a kind of a strange interactive feedback loop. Uh, that 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 only humans have with one another. Um, well, and then there's lots. There's there's a whole list. Like 
there's a, a bunch of famous, you, you may know the names of some of these philosophers, like uh, Derrida or Levinas, who all have connections to phenomenology in some way or another, but not are, are not core phenomenologists. And then here at the bottom, you have Evan Thompson, Sean Gallagher, and Alva Noe. These are people that are very much into phenomenology, but they apply it um, to thinking about consciousness and the brain. So they want to develop a kind of embodied phenomenological account of where consciousness comes from. That's interesting too. Yeah, so these are all people that you could look into if you're interested. If you think from this lecture and from the movie, oh, I want to know more, these would be some names to Google. But let's first return to the beginning of it. Walking around here um, in the real world, we can maybe get a more intuitive feel of what phenomenology is about. Um, first thing to realize is that phenomenology does not look at the world the way that science does, and yet it wants to be really as rigorous and as precise as science is, in the sense that it wants to get at the core fundamental truths about things. But the point is, it wants to do so without, without sort of already from the beginning thinking that behind the world that we right now see through this camera, that there would be some kind of other hidden world that would be more real than what we see right now. So we're now approaching this bench here. You could say that the bench is what it is right now, but of course you could also say, oh, well, this bench is really in reality made from wood and the wood is actually consists of a lot of molecules and the molecules actually consist of atoms and the atoms actually consist of quarks and so on and so forth. And you could say, well, that, those, those scientific theories of the structure of physical nature would be the real story about what we are seeing right here. Well, this is not what phenomenology says. They say, well, all of that is in fact theory. And part of the whole problem is, is that because we are so focused on a theoretical explanation that would be some way behind this experience that we're having right now, um, we, 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 we no longer look at the experience itself and we sort of completely overlook, we immediately step over the experience itself and start looking at the explanations of things behind it. Uh, the founder of phenomenology and who first used that name, you could say, is Edmund Husserl. Uh, he was influenced by Brentano, uh, more like psychologist, phenomenologist. But let's say that Edmund Husserl was really the start of it. Um, he was an Austrian-German um, researcher. He did um, mathematics and philosophy and physics. And um, his, um, like at that moment in time, everybody was trying to be really scientific about things. But Edmund Husserl had the idea that as people were moving into uh, physics and, and studying uh, all, all, these, all these scientific theories were coming up, hard sciences, he was saying, yeah, well, well if, it, if, it's, if we talk about consciousness and about our experience of, of things, we're actually sort of moving away from our experience. And we're searching for all kinds of other explanations like brain function or... Uh, uh, well, genes was not really a thing at the time, but he would have critiqued that too, I think. And he was saying, no, 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 no. We shouldn't find explanations behind our experience. What we should do is be very scientific and precise about describing what our experience actually is like. So we should go back to the things themselves. And with things, he did not mean molecules or atoms or quarks. He meant the things as we experience them, like I'm sitting, I'm sitting in a cafe and there's a cup of coffee right before my eyes. What is happening? What is going on right here between me and that cup? Right? So he wanted to go, go back to the things themselves. 
And one of the methods that he developed for that was called bracketing, uh, was the phenomenological reduction. And one of the words that was central in that was bracketing. He said, everything you think you already know about the world, all the knowledge, everything you've been told, everything that you've learned from books, from other people, from stories, from imaginations, all of that you need to bracket out and shove away and then you need to see what's left right before your eyes at the moment you take all that all that knowledge that you have in your mind that's sort of obscuring your view you have to put it aside and really see what's there right right in front of you so in that sense Rousseau was very much like Descartes but he was also critiquing Descartes, saying, well, what, what you end up with is not something in your mind. What you end up with is the things in front of you instead of the, in, instead of mental. You, you need to bracket out the mental and then you get to the experience, the, the experience of a thing. So he also was very strong on saying, if I think something, it's not just an isolated thought in my mind there's always it's always a relation it's always directed at something outside of me and it's the the relation which is most important and he called that intentionality so things that if i have an experience or a thought or whatever there is a directedness an aboutness from inside to outside which is the intentionality of my thoughts but i won't go there's a lot to say about that there you can write 10 phd thesis about intentionality and they have been written but i won't go into it uh, for purposes of time okay let me try to explain um, this idea of bracketing uh, a little bit different suppose you are a person you see before you a bicycle you can look at this bicycle in a number of different ways so you could say I'm going to be really scientific about this. This bicycle that I'm I'm looking at is really just a uh, collection of different elements, right? There's two wheels and there's a steering mechanism and so on and so forth. And all this stuff is really just um, metal and uh, plastics and other kinds of materials. And these materials are in reality just um, collections of uh, molecules bind together as we learn it in chemistry. And these molecules are in reality just uh, atoms. And the atoms are in the end just uh, um, protons and neutrons flying around them and these are actually just uh, quarks I don't know how to draw that and the quarks are uh, in the end just um, I think nowadays the endpoint is snares right so some kind of wave function I don't know what this is because I'm not a physicist, but you could say if you look at it in a scientific materialistic way, the bike that is right before your eyes is reduced all the way into something that is very abstract and theoretical, but is supposed to be the ultimate core reality of the world that we look upon right so the world outside of us is in the end snares somehow everything and even our own bodies are part of that right so the point is that we look at the bike but we can also look at ourselves and say oh, oh we are also just atoms which are in the end something like atoms uh, atom parts and then quarks and then snares now you can also say, well, yeah, 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 I'm looking at my own body and at the bike and, and all of that is snares and so on. But in the end, of course, there is a somebody who is looking at all of this. And that's my mind. Right? So I have here inside of me, I have thoughts. 
And if I think that my bike is a bike, then this is something that is in my mind, right? I'm thinking, hey, that's a bike that's in my mind. And I'm thinking, oh, but the bike is really consisting of a number of wheels and a steering rod and, uh, and other things and other parts. And I'm thinking, oh, but the wheel is really just made of metal and bits of plastic. And I'm thinking in my mind, so this is all in my mind, right? I'm thinking, oh, but in the end it's atoms, uh, molecules, and that's uh, just atoms, and these atoms are in the end just uh, protons and neutrons and then electrons going around, and it's not even that they really go in circles, because we learned this in high school, but in reality it's like these sort of regions where they statistically can be, and it's quantum mechanics, and we don't know about it, and then in the end that's quarks somehow, I don't know how to draw that, and that in the end is snares again. So you could also say, well, on the one hand, I'm thinking that all of this is real, but the fact that I'm thinking it makes it also all mental. So either the whole of reality is something in my mind, I as a scientist am thinking that the bike is really consisting of metal and atoms and quarks and so on, that's all theory, right, but it's, and, and it may be true, but even if it's true, it's still somebody thinking that it's true, us, the scientists, right, need a nose. Um, or, all of it is the physical reality outside of me. Right? And here you get this kind of big problem that philosophers have wondered about for hundreds of years, if not longer. Like, is the whole world in our mind as a kind of, are we sort of in a matrix, right? Is it all an illusion in our mind? Or is everything outside of us, but if that's true, where does our mind fit in, right? How do we make the mind also a material thing if everything is in the end supposed to be atoms and quarks, right? So you get this big mind-body problem here. We don't know how to solve that. Now, phenomenology says, hey, guys and girls, that's all fine, but nobody's looking here. What's here? Right in the middle between me and the bike. What if we just what if we just zoom in, so to speak, and say we're gonna look right here and we're gonna put a lens on that and really look very carefully at what's right here in between me and the bike. It's the place right before me where the bike experience sort of emerges. And in order to do that, I need to get rid of all the stuff that's bugging me, like all this mind stuff, I need to completely bracket out. And all this physical stuff, which is basically the same thing, right? This is just the, the one is the mirror image of the other. I need to completely bracket all of this out. Maybe I can choose another color for that and say, okay, we're going to bracket all of this out. This is all theory. I can't experience this. Maybe true, maybe not. I don't care. I'm. It's getting in my way of being able to see clearly. And I'm just going to look right here. And that's the phenomenon. And I want to know what that phenomenon is all about.
Now, um, what is this project that 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 of phenomenology that um, Husserl was getting at? He said, as I as I just already hinted at, he said it was the attempt to describe phenomena, so the things we experience, in the broadest sense as whatever appears in the manner it wishes it, it appears. So not in some other manner that we can then not some other story that we can tell about it no what is the manner in which things appear to us how does do things manifest themselves to consciousness to the experiencer and we want to avoid all misconstructions and impositions placed in advance whether from religious cultural traditions everyday common sense or indeed from science itself so this is the idea of bracketing out all this sort of stories that you already think you know about uh, you have uh, all the knowledge that you already think about stuff but put it away and see what's right there in front of your eyes or as merleau ponty says it it's the search for a philosophy which shall be rigorous science but not like the sciences at that time because it also offers an account of space time and the world as we live them right so not not some kind of abstract uh, physics uh, story about space-time like what Einstein was trying to get at, but the world as we live it, the world as we experience it on a day-to-day -day basis. A direct description of our experience as it is, without taking account of psychological origins, causal explanations, which the scientist, the historian, or the sociologist may be able to provide. Right Now, so I think that's sort of clear what we're trying to do here. Okay, so now um, I want to draw that a little. Uh, so this will come next. Now, um, Huschel had a student, <coughs> Martin Heidegger, and uh, you can do a whole study. You could, you could write even 50 PhD theses about Martin Heidegger, and that those have been written. Um, but again, I can only go into it a little bit. Um, Martin Heidegger was very inspired by Huschel and, and this whole project of phenomenology, but he took it much further, uh, much more radical, so to say, because he said, well, Huschel was right about trying to get to the things themselves again, but then he sort of made the mistake, Huschel, in that he was still uh, too much thinking about it as some kind of thought or mental thing that you would end up with so this this conscious experience right still feels a little bit like it's um it's something that you think right something that is sort of in your mind right so some subjective feeling or something like that whereas if you think about sailing and if you think about what happens at the moment that you see a sailboat and you immediately also make the move of not crashing into the sailboat at the same time, right? It's just one instant. At that moment, you could say, well, there's not even a kind of, there, there's nothing of conscious experience anymore. There is only um, some kind of dealing with the situation. Right, so so what happens at that moment is just that I'm dealing with the situation. It's not that I'm thinking anything. It's not even that I'm having some kind of grand conscious experience. I mean, there is an awareness of something. I'm not I'm not in a coma. I'm not completely not there. I'm I'm there, but being there just means that I'm I'm doing stuff. It's more an action that I do than a thought, right? And Heidegger wanted to get more at that action-related uh, explanation of what is going on in the in the in the in the first moment that I experience the world. And so, so what he said was was things like this: the self and the world, so me and the outside world, belong together in the single entity, and that's called Dasein. So he invented a new world, a new word called Dasein. And he said, Dasein is being in the world. It's me already in the world interacting with stuff. Myself in action, so to speak. And he said, self and world are, are not two separate entities. It's not my consciousness inside here and then the world outside there. right? It's not like, oh, I'm having this thought and it's directed at something outside there in the world. 
like subject and object this is this is the normal way we think about things right we think we are a subject and out there are all kinds of objects that we can think uh, but but Heidegger said no 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 that, that's already wrong that is already a step then you've already lost the phenomenon you're already beyond and you're already in the mode of describing some kind of outside world outside of yourself but at the moment you start to describe the world at the moment I'm at the moment I start to say hey it's a that tree is, that is another tree that is a fence this is a box of Legos this is a lamp you guys don't see it but I see it here yeah, this is um, at the moment I said this is a power plug and it's not the, not a good one so I shouldn't put my phone on this one because it's dangerous at the moment I start to say these kinds of things I'm already making myself into a subject and I'm making this power plug into an object but at that moment I just I see this thing and I just grab it and I start using it without so much as a further thought at that moment I'm I'm not a subject yet and this thing is not an object yet but the whole interaction that is happening there is Dasein. It's being me being in the world. It's nothing but concerned, concerned ab absorption in the world. And so Heidegger said what is first of all given, so what is first of all appears to us as, as, at the moment we, we experience the world with, before we do any thinking and analysis, what is first of all given is poor writing for going in and out, for illuminating, for sitting. So we see what we can do with things as the first, that's the first part of the experience that we have. The writing, the going in and out, the sitting, they are what we are a priori involved with. What we know when we know our way around and what we learn are these four what's. Now this should actually remind you of the theory of James Gibson and his affordances. Basically what Heidegger is saying here is that the first thing that's there in our experience is affordances. Before we make things into objects, we just see opportunities for action. That's the first thing we see and that's what the world is to us in the first instance. This is also what Heidegger calls the Zuhandenheit of things. So Heidegger talks about Zuhandenheit and Vorhandenheit. Zuhandenheit in English is called um, ready to hand. So it's something that it's immediately up for grasps. For right, it's right in front of you, and you just grab it and start using it. And Vorhandenheit is present at hand, which is more like the it 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 describes the object that is before you. So um, suppose you are a uh, skilled carpenter. Let's just, I'm really bad at this digital tablet thing. I'm gonna try. So I'm gonna make it a cartoon. It's the only thing I can. So suppose um, you are skilled carpenter with lots of curls because it's corona time so we didn't go to the hairdresser yet ha 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 I went to the hairdresser um, but carpenter and the carpenter has a hammer in hand because Heidegger actually uses the example of the hammer it's a famous example he says okay suppose you have the hammer in hand what kind of hammer is this my god claw hammer yeah. suppose you have this hammer and you know how to use it right so you're sort of you have a you're working on a project and you're sort of hammering away putting in the nail right you're busy doing it well at this moment this this carpenter is not looking at the hammer this carpenter is looking at the project these wooden planks I don't know what he's making or she I mean can be anything and the carpenter is sort of focused on the nail and focused on the whole thing on the whole structure that they are making and you could say that the hammer 
is sort of completely transparent. It's become completely a part of your action perception coupling cycle, right? So if we would draw this in a kind of different way, you could say there's a there's a circle, ongoing circle here going on through the person's body, through the object, through their hand. Oh, it's actually going maybe the other way around. It's even two directions. That's not even making the directional thing. But there's this this complete coupling of what the person is looking at, what they're doing, and their body. And the hammer is just part of that, right? So the hammer is completely transparent, completely part of this cycle, and sort of becomes just an extra part of your of your own body, of your skilled body. Heidegger says that the hammer is trans parent and this is also what we call zuhandeln so heidegger says the mode of being so the, the the sort of being that the hammer is for us in our phenomenological experience of the world at that moment is that the hammer is zuhandeln and we don't see the hammer at all it's it's not there as an object <clears throat> however if the carpenter has this sort of poster hanging at the wall which explains this strange specific tool called hammer i'm getting better with this and it says it's the claw hammer and this is like a specific thing with all kinds of properties and there's explanations like the manual for the hammer explaining it and step one two three of how to use it and so on and if the carpenter looks at that at somebody stops or she stops working and looks at this poster to inspect like oh how does this hammer work and what kind of hammer is this and how do you use it and so on at that moment you can say the hammer is an object for us it's a thing and it's not part of us but it's really a separate thing separated from us and we look at it and we look at it at the object and the properties and the things that it is and in that moment so it becomes an explicit object for for us and we look at it at that moment as a subject. Yeah, so at the moment the thing becomes an object for us, we become a subject, and the interaction with it that we have makes it that the mode of being of this hammer is for Hanman. Yeah, and our relation at that moment with the hammer is now a relation of explicit, um, an explicit thinking about and inspecting the hammer. And that is also what makes us at that moment a subject. Whereas if we are in the transparent mode of interaction with the hammer and the hammer is too handen, then we are not a subject that looks on the world. We are just absorbed coping. And it's this is Dasein. Now the other thing is also Dasein. So Dasein is the sort of overall um, description of us, and we can be either in this sort of subject-object mode of being, and we can be in this transparent Zuhandeln mode of being with the world. But um, in any case, this is the the big difference between Zuhandeln and Vorhandeln, explained by the ha with the hammer. Is that in the Zuhandeln case, the hammer is in hand, you are skilled in using it, you are not looking at it, the whole hammer is sort of disappeared from you, uh, from view, and you are focused on the work that you're doing, and the hammer just forms an integrated, implicit part of it. Whereas if you really look at the hammer as a thing, 
and start to think about it and and reason about what that this hammer is and why it is different from another kind of hammer or whatever, then it's four handen. Yeah, and you can see also in the movie that we're gonna look at how how this works in in skilled uh, skilled craftsmen, for example, that you see the affordance of stuff. First of all, so Gibson himself said. An affordance is not an objective property, it's also not a subjective property, right? So it's a very phenomenological statement to make, that if I see a chair, it's not an object, it's the way I see the chair is not an objective property of the thing, and it's also not just a thought in my mind, so it's not something physical out there, it's not just a thought in here, no, it's both or neither, it's in, it's in between there, it, the affordance cuts across the dichotomy of subjective objective. And Heidegger would say the affordance comes before, it's primordial, it's prior to any understanding of the world in terms of subject thinking about objects. Even before that, we already feel or experience the world, we live it. And affordance is a, is, is a term that comes pretty close to, to pointing at that, that kind of primordial experience, or as Heidegger would call it, the Zuhandenheit. Now Maurice Merleau-Ponty, who is a little bit behind me, unfortunately, um, he built further in a way on that, but his phenomenology, in, in, in contrast to Heidegger, was much more focused on the body itself. He was also more interested in, for example, neurological patients. And he was describing, and, and the brain, and the working of the brain, and he was describing how when you see something, your physical body and your biological body and your, your what you can do with your body is involved with how you see things. So he was very interested in these action perception couplings in, in the, if you wait if you wish and in the action relatedness of uh, of perception so he said if we think about this this first moment of experiencing the world and the world is not objects out there and it's not thoughts in my mind but it's something in between what is in between there there must be something that sort of anchors it or grounds it and he said, well, it's actually our body. Our body is grounding it. Our, our body is not some kind of internal mental thought structure. And our body is also not just an object out there in the world. He huh? famously said things, things like, uh, when I move an object, I, 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 I grab it, right? And I, I take it from one place to another place. But when I move my own body, uh, it's not that I just grab myself as a, like from, with a crane and then put myself somewhere else. No, when I move my body, I'm going through the world, which is a very different thing, right? So he said he saw the body as a very special thing that is not something out there and not something completely in here, but at the boundary of it, sort of the interface between inner and outer, the self and the world. I do not need to observe my body and ask it to move. I am my body. It's a nice quote. So he says, for example, um, the word here, if we apply it to my own body, it doesn't refer to a determinate position in relation to some external coordinates, right? Being here, I'm here doesn't mean I'm in this physical location in the house or something like that. It is actually the start where all coordinates begin. So in the end, when I'm thinking about coordinates and about meters and distances and uh, the difference between something being here and there, it's all in the end related to my body, right? Because the whole experience of the world starts with me. So I'm the ultimate zero, zero starting point. Right? I can put a coordinate system outside of me. I can make it objective and say, oh, I'm going to define that to be 0, 0. But even if I define that point over there as 0, 0, and I start to uh, calculate where I am relative to that point, still in the end, I can only make sense of that by first 
experiencing myself to be here in the world, right? So in the end, I'm still the zero, zero, the real zero, zero, so to speak, even if I create an external artificial zero, zero anchor point somewhere else. Yeah, so I'm the first coordinate. I'm the anchoring, um, and my, my body anchors the, the whole situation and the spatiality of the situation. Now, and what Meryl Ponti, I, I already hinted at that in, in, in earlier lectures, what he, of course, famously worked out to some detail is how objects can come to be sort of incorporated. So using a car, a, a, a hat, a stick, and how they sort of becomes, become extensions of our body and that we, through these objects, interact with the world and approach and see the world in a new light, right? And if I'm a good sailor, my whole boat, my whole sailing boat and the rod that I keep behind me with my hand and my eyes and my hand and my, my rod and my sail, it becomes one big body. I am the boat. And I move with my boat over the water instead of being in the boat and thinking, oh my God, where is this boat going? Which is what happens if you're a novice, right? If you're a novice car driver, you sit in a car and you press the gas pedal and then <gasps> it's moving. Oh my God, it's moving. You, you probably remember this if you had driver's lessons, this first moment that you thought, oh, the car is doing stuff and I don't have control. But if you have a driver's license now, you drive in the car, it's completely different. You are the car. You can even sometimes feel where the, if you, if you have a car for a long time, you just sort of feel where the front and the back is and you just park yourself in the parking space, right? And you are the thing that's all, ranging all the way from the front of the car to the back of the car. So th these are the kinds of things that, that Merleau Ponty was talking about for a long time. He also says something about movement. A movement is learned when the body understands it. That is when it has incorporated it into its world. And to move one's body is to aim at things through it. It is to allow oneself to respond to their call, which is made upon it independently of any representation. Motility, then, is not as it were a handmaid of consciousness transporting the body to that point in space of which we already have, have a representation beforehand. So here's, here's sort of critiquing the traditional idea of cognitive science that we have some kind of software in our brain that is sort of planning a certain movement and then the software would give the instructions to our body as if the body was just a robot that would get the explicit instructions to move 10, 10 steps to the front, three steps to the right, raise your arm so many degrees, grab the object in this and this orientation and so on to make sure that the, the, the movement is carried out in exactly the way that it was planned on beforehand in a representation in your mind. No, the movement is... Um, so it's in, in the first sentence, what does, it, what does he mean here? A movement is learned when the body understands it, when it has incorporated it into its world. So this is, this is the moment at which, if you are the sailor again, the moment is with the movements of the, of, the, of the steering rod in your sailboat, if they completely become part of the way you sort of negotiate or deal with the world in a meaningful way. So you, by constantly moving, you sort of, you get the hang of it, you, you control, you, you are in control of what happens, right? So you see that boat coming right at you and you already know instantly to, to press it or to uh, do uh, so there's one thing with sailing for example that 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 beginners find difficult the the if you have a, a steering rod pushing it from you right of course makes you go to the left and drawing it to you makes you go to the right right and if you sit on the other side it's the other way around so in the end it doesn't matter where you sit for example in the beginning sitting on one side and then switching over to the other side will make you think again oh do i need to uh, pull or push uh, oh my god oh my god right a movement is learned when the body understands it, when it has incorporated it into its world, and to move one's body is to aim at things through it. So through this movement, I'm steering my sailing boat and I'm making sure that the boat is not crashing into me. And I don't have to think about it from a distance saying, oh, where do I need to, how do I need to um, give my hand, what kind of instruction do I need to give my hand, push or pull? No, 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 that's not what it is. Right, that's that's very that's artificial, and maybe in the beginning you try that, and then also you fail miserably. But 
after a while you just are the steering rod you are the boat and you just go where you want to go and that's what movement is about i'm not looking at this thing as a tree i'm not calling it a tree because that's all knowledge that i've been told in school this is a tree and this is grass and and what are those flowers called all of that doesn't matter i'm just going right back into the immediate experience that i'm having right now how does that feel in a way you cannot take yourself out of the equation right so the experience in any case has something to do with you you are there experiencing the thing but it's also not something that is completely inside of you the experience is not in your head as a thought it is right here we are we are here in the world experiencing this world right Now, as Hubert Dreyfus explains it, he says, well, let's consider that most of the time we're not thinking about these experiences, we're not contemplating our experiences, we just are in the world together with things, and we're just experiencing them, and this is what he called absorbed coping. What Merleau-Ponty, for example, emphasized was that your own body is, of course, directly tied into the way that the world shows up for you. Consider, for example, for a moment that I would be a small child. What if you would be a small critter? This would give you, again, a completely different experience. There it goes. Did it catch a fish? It had a fish, yeah, it definitely has a fish. And you could say, well, for the heron and for me, the world is different, but this is only a mental projection, right? The, the heron just sees the world differently than I do, because different things are important to the heron than, than to me. But phenomenologists would say, well, Yes, but in the end, if you reason this through, this goes for everyone, right? There's no, there's no end to this. So there is no ultimate real reality that is somehow independent from either the heron or from a human being looking at the world. There is only these different worlds of experience. It doesn't necessarily mean that experience is completely inside of you. It just means that um, the world, as every individual being perceives it, is always necessarily um, contextualized by, the, by that person, by the observer. It's observer dependent. What would the world be like for a bumblebee? How does the bumblebee perceive the world? You already see that we humans who want to be the scientists, who want to observe the real world as it really is, always in the end have a problem. And the problem is that 
as you can see, we, we don't even see the ultraviolet, so, so we, can, we can never see the world in the way the bumblebee sees it. And we can have some kind of scientific theory about ultraviolet light, but that's not the same thing, right? So now, at this moment, the world has become a little bit different for me, because now I have this object in hand, and suddenly, this thing here is approachable, but I already sort of see it in the way the world shows up for me that those things over there I cannot reach with my stick, but this thing over here I can reach it. Right? So at this moment there is a new category, a sort of difference has emerged in the world, a differentiation between things that are about here and things that are over there. Now at this moment I'm only talking about a stick and a very binary difference between reachable things and unreachable things. But if you imagine that this stick is a more complex tool, like a knife, and you would be talking about things like uh, cutting and, and um, tending to things, like weeding in your garden, yeah? then depending on the tools that you're able to use in a skillful way, the whole garden looks to you a very different way than it would if you would not have the tools and if, if you would not have the skills for dealing with the tools. Right, so, so Hubert Dreyfus, um, I will not say a lot about him, I think, in terms uh, just also looking a little bit at the time. Um, I really encourage to see the movie, which explains all of his uh, philosophy. Um, but um, he, in at least in one paper, he describes how we have sort of these innate structures. Our physical body makes certain things possible for us. Then on top of that, we get basic skills of moving our, our own body in the, in the environment, right? This is the sailor seeing the sailing world. And then you get cultural skills, like for example, um, uh, the mailbox affords letter posting is what Gibson also talks about. But you could also say, um, so it's not just about knowing how to steer the sailing boat, but also the rules, like do I have to pass the sailing boat on the left or on the right side and, and when, uh, those are cultural agreements, right? There's no, no explicit, there, there's no uh, fundamental rule about that. That's just an agreement that we made. And that you can also at some point incorporate so that it becomes totally uh, habitual and, 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 and you don't have to think about it anymore, right? So if you drive your bike or your car in the city, there's so many things you do which are conventional, right? They are just rules that we that you had to learn. And, and it could be different rules. Like in, in the UK, it's different from in the Netherlands. You would drive on the right or at the left-hand side. But uh, once you have them incorporated into your bodily responsive system in this way that we have, are now describing, it becomes totally habitual, automatic. And, and Dreyfus describes this whole stage-like development, how you go from the textbook rules all the way to just seeing what needs to be done. The final um, thing that is maybe good to uh, spend a little bit to, the final thing that's maybe good to, to mention is this idea of optimal grip. It's also a term used by Merleau-Ponty. So what Merleau-Ponty says, if, if, I'm, if I wanna understand something, like I wanna understand what's going on in the world, um, it's not that I need to have the right sort of knowledge about that thing represented in my mind. It's not like a list of facts that I need to learn about the thing. No, what I need to learn is how to deal with the situation. That's the first, that's the focus. I need to be able to respond to the situation in the right sort of way. And I'm constantly, in that sense, I'm constantly searching for having grip on the situation. And this means that at the moment I feel insecure and I don't know what to do and I start to doubt and worry and, and things happen out, sort of outside of me and I don't, have, I don't have control anymore. That's the moment when you start searching for a new form of grip. So you start to act yourself in order to get into touch with the world again and, and to get 
get a little, get a handle on it, so to speak. And that's what we actually are constantly doing. And what uh, Dreyfus explains in, in re reference to Mariponti is that with each new skill that you learn and with each new tool that you're able to use, um, you make a new sort of distinction in the world, right? So, so returning again to the sailboat example, uh, in the beginning, all these sailboats look the same. But once you learn the skill of how to read the boats as coming at you at crash course or passing you on the left or the right, suddenly all the sailboats now are suddenly they are distinguished into these three classes. Going on the left, safe. Going on the right, safe. Crash course, dangerous. Need to act on it. Right? Those three categories of boats, they appear to you and you see the boat suddenly as three different things. And this is because you have learned to deal with the boat in the new boats in a new wheel way. And this is strongly related to your developing skill of managing and steering the actual boat, right? It's not something you just learn as a, from a book. Uh, it's, it's really tied into and connected to what it feels like to be in the boat and steering the boat, right? So if I see a boat eating land or spitting land, um, I, I really feel myself steering the boat at the same time. These are not two different things. They are interconnected. So this also means you don't need an explicit goal. It's the world always is sort of pulling at you and saying, sort of saying to you, hey, we need to talk. And we need to get into kind of harmony again, because right now we're not really in a harmony. So um, Merleau-Ponty, for example, describes that if you are in a museum and you see an, uh, a painting, um, you immediately start to move going more close to the painting and back. And then you sort of find the right spot that is sort of the good distance from which to uh, appreciate this painting. Right? And finding that spot is the optimal grip for you on that painting as a visitor of a museum at that point. Now to summarize, um, Phenomenology focuses not on what's in your mind. It focuses not on what's out there as objective things in the in the in the world in reality. Uh, it actually says that that all of that comes later. And when a scientist starts to describe objectively the things outside, that's also the moment when we sort of invent or create the idea of an internal subject or mind who is thinking about the outside world. But the phenomenologist said, well, before all that, there is no outside and inside as such. There is only the interaction and it, there's only the being in the world, which Heidegger calls Dasein. And the way that the world shows up for you is, first of all, just like Gibson and his affordances says, the Zuhanden world. How does my body act and cope with the world? How do I negotiate, deal, respond to the situation? That's what's first of all given. And according to Merleau-Ponty, it's the body that's the ultimate anchor for this, right? So I am everything I see and all the spatial relations that I perceive outside of me are in the end egocentrically related to me because I'm the first starting point where it begins but 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 saying that i'm the first starting point does not mean my thoughts are the first starting point no 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 it's my body my lived living active body that's the starting point and on the inside something like reflection contemplation and and, and mind and thinking grows and on the outside a whole world for me to think about grows they grow at the same time but at the center is my living body. And that's what embodied interaction is all about. Thank you.